and juntas could be prodded into secular passivism, whatever that might be, or rule this world from the Mount of the Sermon, the church on an equal footing with high-handed secular powers? We have different agonies today, and a far less grandiose understanding of who we are vis-a-vis -vis this world, humiliated, pruned as John's gospel has it, far less assured, more improvisational, obscurely searching. Christians, I thought, will know what I am groping for. The Purgatorio is unique within the Commedia. The Paradiso and the Inferno are on the Church's traditional ground. Dante voyaged to hell, and heaven is a spectator, exalted, horrified in turn, but a bystander. Moreover in both, the ethics, the arrangement of justice, reward, punishment, are conformed to the orthodoxy of pulpit and Bible, horrors of sense, deprivation of God's presence on the one hand, on the other, glory, beatific vision. He is verifying a tradition already well attested to, a tradition which he imbibed through a porous culture of art and word. But the Purgatorio is his own. This biblical man, this sensitive and finely tuned mind, this traditionalist is also nervy and undaunted, an innovator. Did he find traditional purgatory, those subterranean regions of fire spoken of in sermons and tracts, not simpatico with his temperament, his sense of Christ? In any case, he struck out on his own. He imagined an immensely lofty mountain of pilgrimage, delay, penance, a kind of crow patrick of the spirit. And then he climbed it, or rather, he beckoned the dead along with him, appointed Virgil his guide, and proceeded to follow, where in fact he could only have led. Less dogma surrounds purgatory, a region lying somewhat to the side of the eye. Neither ecstasy nor damnation, rather a kind of passionate waiting game goes on there, played out by souls who on earth have been wasteful, neglectful, or neglectful of responsibility, grace. This was a capital point with Dante. Purgatory was firmly anchored in this world in time. He imagined souls sentenced to purgation in accord with their time, serving or disserving on earth. At the foot of the mountain, souls hunker about. The time of their denial of entrance is equivalent in one way or another to the time they have let go, wasted, badly used on earth. The point is a striking one, crucial to the art as well as to Dante's view of human nature. If indeed there exists a continuity of conscience and self-understanding between this world and another, then among other benefits, human dignity is honored. Nothing is wasted, including judgment on the high quality or shabbiness of moral action. Nothing is overlooked, nothing falls in a void. The absurd, the rock of Sisyphus, is itself rendered absurd. All this struck me like a bolt. It is the reason why, at a comparatively late time of my life, I began to study the Purgatorio. There was that tantalizing question, did Dante conceive Purgatory as a world apart from our own, attached to ours only by the frail cable of suspended questioning? Or was Purgatory joined to our world as a mountain to a plain, as in the moral order, consequences joined to conduct? Here and now, Purgatory, and Dante within it, attesting to its realities, identifying its faces, toting up its crimes and reprisals, its hard-won joys, gratitude, moral victories. He sees with bodily eyes its angels and invisible spirits and forms, including our own form, souls. A world only slightly out of focus with what our eyes, our ears hear, our eyes touch, as indeed the essential quality and forms, the truth of things must always be out of focus, out of style, out of relevance, in comparison with the lies and semblances which this world hucksters as truth. This is as far as I can understand the only real strangeness of Purgatorio, not the strangeness of another physical world of Mars contrasted with Earth, nor the strangeness of mere allegory, though allegory is certainly one of his methods. Something different, disturbing, because shot through with the familiar and the unfamiliar all at once, somewhat as though Jesus had kept a diary of his forty days in the Judean desert. Demons, hallucinations, perhaps, presentiments of the future, 
the liberated, the damned, the near blessed, pressing on him their malignancy, blessings, a record of many strange things, seen, attested to, truth and untruth, telling much, hinting at more. Or I think of mountains of pilgrimage, journeys of intercession, the seven-story mountain of Merton. If a pilgrim fasting were to keep a record of a night-long vigil on such a mountain, we might well have another hint as to Dante's method, the cold, fasting, the sleepless vigil, all work on the brain. One sees things, understands things not granted to mortals at sea level. There are encounters through the long night with other penitents, seekers, strangers become friends, recognition scenes, outstretched arms across a chasm of years and years. On such nights we are told that the dead walk abroad, no strangers to the living, gross occupations, lifelong distractions, the appetitive soul weighing down the body, the body dragging its appetites through the world of sense and slavery. Do not these prevent access to the world of truth? Come, let us enter the discipline of the mountain. Dante was a son of the church. This is the great honor I can pay him. By it I mean something quite simple and crucial. He draws clean lines. He knows the gospel and its other face, betrayal. In himself, first of all, then in others, including those in high places. He knows the complexity of life in the world, how it sinks some under, bears other lo others along, always uneasily, and he is not bewitched by complexity, ambiguity. He does not make a vocation out of head-scratching. No, there are sin and error and foolishness, rancor, ill-will, lust. These are not fabrications to keep people in line, names unattached to realities. They are sin. He says so. And there is redemption. Hope beats on, never gives up. As long as time lasts, there is possibility of blessedness against all hope, against the main chance. It is a word Dante spoke first of all to himself, and for this I thank him, that he did not exempt himself from the fate of humans, but set himself firmly on the mountain where all must work out the salvation they have betrayed or scorned. He is there, ascending, wondering, doubting, confessing, and judging. One to one he goes, with his friend and teacher, ascending through clutter and darkness to lucid essentials, discovering what a human being might be, a human life, a life worth living, renewing the symbols that sustain, foster, lend stature, beget clairvoyance, and courage. He makes life new. He walks in spite of all, sure-footed. It is called a tradition. It is the stark opposite of a dead religion. Dante knew it. He could not merely inherit such riches, nest in them, live off them. In this respect, he reminds me of the canny investor spoke of by Christ. What then to do? He was a poet and a public man. He would move the tradition along, a spider thread from his being, telling, testing as he went. He called to his side one who had done something like this long before, Virgil. Because it seems he wanted an opposite number in Gandhi's phrase, in the manner of the truly great who seek a loving adversary, a friend who will tell the truth, especially the unpleasant truth, someone subdued by leveler death, someone creaturely, one who had made a like voyage, a world wanderer, creator of heroes, and more. In Dante's eyes, Virgil was mentor, moral teacher, guide, a kind of secular saint. Exactly as things turn out, and with necessary nuances, what Dante became to me. Dante was a time, one remembers, that trumpeted its great, on every wind. It was a time of dazzling, innovative art, of the new vernacular poetry. The center was holding. Synthesis was the intellectual mode. Christendom turned a confident face on the empire, the world beyond. It could afford to be generous. Were not its glories evident, intact? And, along with all this, as it seems, must be true in every imperial age, violence. Dante lived with it, was immersed in it. As leader of one warring faction, he inevitably became its victim. As it turned out, exile was his salvation. As I learned, too, both in 1965 and again in 1970, when I read with bitter relish and a nod of recognition, how bitter to taste the salt of another's bread and climb another's stair. 
Still, it seems to me that without the suffering, dependence, wanderings, and above all, the solitude and study of those nineteen years of banishment, we would have no commedia. The imperial stereotype, Florence, not just a city, more like a state, wars, its own coinage, trade, flag, ambassadors, above all, wars, and when foreign wars were lacking, internal fighting, bloody conflicts of interest, does it evoke a tick re recognition? The leading candidates for slaughter in Dante's lifetime, he belonged to one of them, were the blacks and the whites. Florence was a minute image of Rome. Arrangements were not working well. Above all, they worked ill for Dante. Still, he thought for a long time that Rome had worked well. He was not granted to see, in other words, that no imperium in history has worked well, if by the phrase we mean something approaching the evangelical commonweal, implying access by all to justice to the goods and services of the realm, public officials who serve instead of battening no prisons or sanctioned state murders and so on. Dante was blind to these grievous shortcomings in his social order. Indeed, in the Purgatorio, he enshrined the social arrangements of the empire in his aesthetic and political vision. He still thought, even in his great poetry, that the church imperium arrangement was of divine origin, that the destitute condition of the times was due to repairable malice, simony, ego, but that the arrangement was literally in the nature of things, that it was a divine plan. Alas, we know otherwise.